Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Good people, welcome back to A Fork in Time. This is Chris Coppola, joined by Robert Koshu and uh, Dylan Holzmer. Dylan, do you want to even try and get a uh, catchphrase this time? I'm afraid to steal yours since you're the host. I don't want to know what bad things are going to happen to me, so I'll pass. <laughs> so today's topic, I, I have to admit, I might have given everyone like a very, very long explanation of this. But it gets back to the TV in my office being out, and I hooked a DVD player into it and started watching The World at War. I think most of us have have at some point seen it. It's Laurence Olivier. It's the BBC. It's classic. And watching the episode on the early North African campaign, uh, they have a British general on, and this British general basically – in the interview with him, and this is maybe 30 years later, gave us the fork. He, in this, mon- I mean, Robert, Dylan, you guys have all seen it, right? I mean, oh, yeah. like, formatively. The, the world at war is like, if you haven't, watch it. I, 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 I yeah. Um, Dylan, go ahead. What's, what's the fork? What set us up? What happened? All right. So this... Uh, so World War II, in case you didn't know, it's the Allies versus the Axis. Um, in 1941, this is very early 1941, we're talking you know, January, just after the New Year, um, the phony war has finally ended. Germany's invaded France. France has fallen. Vichy France has been set up. But around the world, this is still sort of the 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 height of the German war machine on the march, and everyone is still reacting. So the, the free French are trying to figure out what's going on in the colonies. East Asia is still up for grabs before the Japanese have really started rolling. Uh, Britain is trying to keep control of whatever they've got left of their colonial possessions, especially in Africa. So Britain is positioned in sort of the the Eastern sort of North Africa around the Suez, uh, the Mandate of Palestine, you know, all of that, where uh, they're fighting Italy, who's taken their sort of little attemptive neo-Roman adventure into Libya, which doesn't really work out for them. So the British are fighting against the Italians in an operation known as Operation Compass. And basically what happens, the, the Brits go from Egypt, they try and sort of spearhead into Libya, and they get basically as far as Tobruk. Um, I believe is the last major um, or the, the the first real town in Libya that they approach when Operation Compass is sort of like fulfilled. Long and the short Brooke. version. They take to Brook. Yeah, uh, you're right. 100, 130,000 that... Italian casualties. Uh, yeah. Prisoners of war. You're, you're um, absolutely right. Uh, just a point. I mean, there's only like two towns in Libya worth well. talking about. Yeah, so this is it, one of them. I'm just saying. They definitely like, take is... Tobruk. But like, if you can picture how like Tobruk is on the northern coast, and past that, you can kind of picture the 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 coastline goes south. They're almost at Tripoli, which is the other major port. So yeah. they're they've almost driven. They basically yeah the they Italians do they do as much there. damage as they can do in mm-hmm. Italy, and then for better or for worse, uh, mostly worse. The Brits decide, hey, this operation is so well, it's done. And you just kind of like, you know, it's North Africa. There's not a whole lot of supply lines. So the the British forces in there uh, under you know General O'Connor, uh, they stop. Need to resupply, refit, all of that stuff. Let supply lines catch up. Winston Churchill and the British High Command decide that this in, in early, now we're talking mid-February. Uh, the British High Command decides this is the perfect time to take, I I can't remember the exact number, but it's like six out of nine cores. And we're talking the fully strengthened ones, not the the sort of, you know, uh, sort of cripples, bastards and broken things ones to use a Game of Thrones reference. Basically, all of the good troops they send up to Greece to try and fend off the imminent German and Italian invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. That does not go well. 
needless to say. And it ends up not going well for North Africa either, because shortly after these troops go and disappear up to Greece, Rommel, a new arrival right before this in North Africa, begins his famous adventures where he becomes known as the Desert Fox. And actually, O'Connor gets captured. He serves out basically the entirety of the war in a prisoner of war camp. He gets liberated in 43 when the Italians Mm -hmm. surrender. Yeah. He actually gets liberated in 43 when the Italians surrender and does come back and actually is commanding troops in Normandy, Market Garden, and just, you know, O'Connor is amazing because he was born in India. His father was a British soldier. Um, For those of you that aren't familiar with, you know, last names, O'Connor is not necessarily what I would consider the most, like, I'm trying English, to English, English, uh, British, British, British. Mm. He's not a, perf- yeah, he was not a British. <laughs> um, there's there there's some Scots who may take some umbrage with that, but we'll leave it. Uh, but so, you know, he's, he's got an Irish last name. He's born in India. He actually um, is in India during the British pullout. And at the end of the war, he is commanding British troops on the Eastern front of the Eastern Front in India. So he's a man of empire, but he does come back and actually, like, they put him back. Yeah, they do. So they do put him back, but he does miss out for a couple of years. But but I guess the main gist of the the important part of why this is a, a, a good place for a fork is this is the, the sort of high point of the initial phase mm-hmm. of the North African campaign. After this, when those troops leave after Operation Compass, the Brits are on the back foot. They don't come back until you start having the Free French and the uh, the naval invasions in Operation Torch and invading Casablanca. That, you know, it takes another, what, year and a half, two years before you really have a secure North Africa after this. So the 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 idea for the fork is what if those troops don't get pulled away? You know, what does that do to this North African campaign where the Brits are very much foot forward and have the Italians, not so much the Germans because they're not really there yet, but the Italians on the back foot? What does this do to the war if we change this one sort of theater and how does that impact the entire rest of World War Two? So I'll let Chris go with the, uh, the the granular details since this is his his sort of. I mean, I liked all of that. Um it is a bit of a more seesaw than it sounds. Uh, the the Germans. So this is and and thank you, Dylan, for keeping me honest on this. Um, basically, before the British made the decision to withdraw these troops to send to Greece, Rommel has landed in Libya and landed in Tripoli. He hasn't done anything yet. He has landed and he is waiting for his tanks to unload. Um, immediately after that, he launches an assault and, like like Dylan mentioned, captures General O'Connor and drives back all the way into Egypt, except for Tobruk, which is isolated and held. Then the British, under Auchinleck, drive Rommel all the way back and relieve Tobruk. Then Rombo comes back and drives the British all the way back over what they just took again and stops at El Alamein. And El Alamein begins, you know, the 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 counteroffensive there with Montgomery begins in October of 42. Torch landings are in November of 42. So those two and, you know, the they kind of pincer and take over Tunisia and North Africa is done by like February, March 43. All of that's great. So the first thing we talked about was Rommel's on the ground. What? And, 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 you know, okay. Yeah. We actually talked off podcast like we always do. What happens to Rommel? And what, what did we like about that? <laughs> Well, Rommel, Rommel is – he is a massive strat, strategy guy. He is the German – he is, without a doubt, the German's number one strategy guy. And so he takes one look at the whole thing, and 
in my mind, one of two things happens. He he takes the aggressive assault that he was known for from the World War One. Even that's where he got his name was really leading those assaults or he pulls out. I'm going to say he leads the assault, but instead of running into a couple of broken down tank divisions, <laughs> he runs into a full fledged British army that had all the success and the Luftwaffe took a while to get get set up. So he doesn't have the air cover that he really needs yet either. And so I, I kind of like the idea, Chris, I think you threw up in the midst of this. It, it flips. O'Connor captures Rommel now. Mm-hmm. So we remove Rommel. Rommel had the chess pieces off the board for the for the Germans. Well, I think that that does an important thing. If we if Rommel is taken off the board, it changes the tactical plan for the German high command in North Africa, because one of my favorite stories about Rommel and it, it gets into the funny sort of international military rivalries between Italy and Germany is Rommel basically to both the Italians and his own high command was like, Eric Cartman, screw you. I'm going to do whatever I want. And if not, I'm going home. Um, basically, he literally ignored and completely made up a a message to it wasn't it Italo Balbo, maybe I forget who yeah. one of the Italian generals, because he knew he couldn't read Germany. He was like, yeah, the Germans said I can do whatever I want. When in reality, what they had said is don't go anywhere, fortify, yeah. catch up on your supplies. And he says, no, I'm going to go attack now. So and that he, is what started he, his he, famous he, offense. He, he, he was supposed to do an armed reconnaissance. But once he figured out what he was against. He charged forward, (laughs) which technically, depending on your definition of armed reconnaissance, how heavily armed you are, (laughs) might be still allowable (laughs) under command interpretations. I mean, the thing I love, you you mentioned what Rommel did in the First World War. Who was he fighting in the First World War? The Italians. The Italians. He was fighting the Italians in the Alps. And he had a, you know, he had a very low opinion of the fighting abilities of his allies, especially since he dropped into a situation where you mentioned 130,000 uh, prisoners were taken. 130,000 uh, 130, prisoners were taken by, as I remember, 36,000 British troops. So yeah, to, to be generous, to, I think. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just for, like just, it's it's a highball 36,000. Yeah. Just just. To, to put a very fine point on that, because you know what, I'm I'm one of those people. When, once you start hearing thousands, like it, it, you could lose every single British soldier in the Western Desert Force captured at least four Italians. That's how the numbers work out. <laughs> Mamma mia! So, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. They, they <laughs> literally just captured everybody they could. Yeah. And it, it looked bad. And, and, you know, put it this way. If you were if you were not feeling it anyway with. Oh, yeah. With the Italians. You're well, either going to you're either going to charge forward like you would or you're going home. And that that's the yeah. only two options we have with Rome. Yeah. And it's if, if you're in a situation where you're facing such a, a much more, you know, up to strength British force, an attack is. You know, it may have some initial successes, but, it, you know, the the medium to long term, it's not going to succeed, especially when you have a bunch of German troops that are, you know, to be generous two weeks off the boat, you know, going across the Mediterranean, which mostly Italian control. But there are still some attempts, especially near British territory, to try and, and keep, you know, some naval supremacy, especially around the Suez. So these guys have not been chilling in the German Alps for like a couple of years. These guys have had kind of a nervous time. So I think, you know, Rommel, even if he does attack, which, you know, say he does, it doesn't go well. It's not he's not taking advantage of understrength and disorganized British forces. He's fighting a full on army. And I think it drives him back. And within a week or two, he's going to, you know, he's going to get captured. The rest of the German forces are going to honestly have, you know, to brook well, not to Brook, but, you know, maybe Tripoli is going to be known to the Germans and Italians, almost like a, a an Axis Dunkirk in North Africa. And then basically the rest of Italian Libya is essentially relatively wide open for British advance. So well, in, in my mind, the the Germans look at it and go, the Germans weren't all that enamored of 
the attack of the North African campaign to begin with. They were kind of like, yeah, whatever, you're our allies. What do we got we can send? We'll send you a good commander and some stuff, but this isn't like we're not this is the thing that we're willing to die on. Keep yeah. in mind, keep in mind, right? Like the um the the fork here is the invasion of Greece, the Italian invasion of Greece mm-hmm. that goes right. horribly wrong. The Germans actually wind up invading Yugoslavia and, and Greece, Greece to save the Italians. The, the Italians. The yeah. Italians uh, carbonara, I guess, is yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, save their bacon. Their pasta. And no, no, no. I get, no. I got the joke. I got the joke. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. So they're already doing one thing for you, and you know, there's there's a historical argument that hey, if they don't actually have to do that, they start Barbarossa sooner. They actually, you know. Take Moscow, the have enough to all of that. There's one thing that I'm thinking about now that that I want to talk to us about, and I think I know how it goes, but I want to get opinions. So we talked a little bit about Torch, which happens years later with a lot more diplomacy with the United States involved. If the British are able to draw it to basically take out Tripoli. There's still Alger- Algeria and Tunisia and Morocco that are under the control of the free fr- of the sorry Vichy. the Vichy French yeah. the Vichy French. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Operation I believe it was Crossbow where the British actually the British Navy attacked the French Navy in Iran in North Africa because they wouldn't surrender because they wouldn't come over to the British side. So two years later, when it's the United States, the United States and Britain spend some diplomatic time trying to bring the French, the Vichy French commanders on board to become free French so they won't basically fight us. Do we think that happens here? Do we think the British are able to convert because, again, you know, yes, the British are the power in North Africa now. The Italians are gone. The Germans are probably not playing anymore. But this is the only, you know, Germany has still never actually been beaten. So what do the French in, I'm going to, I'm going to call it Northwest Africa. What do they do? I think they roll over because the, okay. the the French guys were – they weren't all that enamored mm-hmm. at, of playing along to get along because they were separated. They weren't under occupation like every – they were just – there was this Italian-German army next door who had beat the British, so I guess we better play along so we don't have problems. And short of a few units here and there that fought when the Americans landed in mm-hmm. at Torch – they all pretty much surrendered and then signed on to to join the American army marching across Africa. It, it was almost like a few a few units here and there fought. And then after the end of it, it was pretty much, no, nope, we're done. <laughs> Dylan so, looks like he's got something. So, and this could be just a, a, a issue with my history degree that I got all those years ago and didn't really do a whole lot of World War II history, but Vichy was technically neutral. So yeah. I don't know that you can have British forces without an actual declaration of war go into Morocco okay. and Tunisia. So okay. I, mean, I think I think what may happen is there may be we, we, the, we the Italian, not, the Italian side gets locked in. Is neutral. <laughs> the British it had a lot of views though, about right. a lot of people that weren't necessarily <laughs> neutral. And I won't go into a couple hundred years of history there. But um, <laughs> I think at, at the very least from a diplomatic perspective, because, you, you know, the French – the free French especially are in a much more precarious position of colonial acquisitions versus, you know, not, not just in Northern Africa, but equatorial South America, North America, Indonesia. I wonder if the Brits would at the very least ask for de Gaulle's kind of blessing before they move into Mm -hmm. North Africa. And what I'm really getting at is I think there's going to be a small break in advancement. Because obviously there are some communication lines that have to be allowed time to to work. And I can imagine that 
there would at least be some hesitancy, not refusal, mm-hmm. but but hesitancy to let British forces walk in without some kind of understanding of what's going to happen I, 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 in North my Africa? Biggest, my biggest question was, in our timeline, because there is still a large Italian-German army there, and because the United States has, in effect, invaded arguably neutral territory, there is a level of strategic depth provided by Algeria and Tunisia. The yes. the end of the war, you know, Ramos' final evacuation is in Tunisia. Yeah. If they don't allow the Italians to go in, you know, yeah. as far as the British are concerned, as long as you don't let the Italians cross the border and yeah. we can close up the bag, I think they're happy. Yeah, I, I, I think so, too. I think, you know, I, on the one hand, I think it does make it easier for de Gaulle to scoot up you know, the western side of Africa and get to the Vichy, you know, Morocco and Tunisia. I just I don't think it would be the 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 rollover that some people might immediately think. There's a stopping point for the British politically that they can't just ignore. Um, I also wonder if at a certain point in this North African advancement, if even the Italians decide to cut and run, because at this point, just in terms of, you know, mid 41 ish, you know, Mussolini's already trying to, like, move the, the pieces around the chessboard to make himself look better. So if Libya is lost and Italians still have primarily control of the Mediterranean, he may try and get whatever forces he can out and move them back up into his Grecian campaign and to the Italian mainland. Because at least at this point in the Mediterranean, the Italians still have naval parity. With the, the central men, the central, yeah, the central, yeah. Work, so, yeah. so and, and that's what I'm getting at. Like for now, it's it's kind of a retreat and turtle strategy a little bit. I'm, you know, maybe the Italians do just to protect some semblance of operational integrity in the Mediterranean. Um, so I I wonder if there would be an element of that that would sort of cause a short term weakness in the Italian position, but eventually allow a short term, you know, I'm imagining maybe a two three month stalemate while the British consolidate North Africa and then the Italians sort of retrench into, say, you know, Sardinia and and Sicily sort of up while they're dealing with Greece as their main concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those I think it's very easy for them to take whatever is left of those hundred thirty thousand troops. The the like four thousand that are left. (laughs) And ship them to Albania. Or yeah, that's where they send them. They send them to Albania to participate in the Greek. And I think and I think that becomes the next big question that we have to, the, the next immediate theater question that we have to deal with is what happens in Greece and Yugoslavia? Because I'm imagining, I don't know about y'all, but I don't really think that changes very much if the British don't send. I think the main question is if the British don't send troops to the mainland, Greece, do they send them anywhere? And the 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 only place that I can think they may still send is Crete. Because if they can keep at least some kind of defensive fortification on Crete that allows for air bases and ports in the Eastern Med that give them some sort of operational base to go off of. I mean, the Germans eventually, you know, Amphib and and Airborne Air invaded, mm-hmm. yeah, with the, with the Fallschirmjägers um, to take out Crete. But if the Brits send some forces there, do they? Does that maybe change or does that delay a German? Invasion of Crete. I don't think it changes the the actual Greek situation really all that much. I don't think it changes anything because a good number of the troops that were evacuated from North Africa wound up on Crete and wound up losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, it, they go there and they set they they he he instead of doing that he goes there and he sets it up. That's the goal is set Crete up, lock it down. After he consolidates Africa, then we lock up Crete. Yeah. Or or do since the since the Brits are more consolidated in North Africa, does that give the the downfall of Crete at least a recovery position? So, you know, do some of the forces that end up backing up onto Crete. Then from the airborne invasion, if there's British vessels nearby, are those troops at least some you know, not that there was a ton of Greek forces on Crete, but did they can can they then escape to North Africa? And sort of get back in. I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about the Greek theater, I, I, but I think honestly, the British troops that were sent to mainland Greece and Crete 
wound up getting Dunkirk from yeah. both places. I I I I don't see anything changing. Yeah. That situation. And that and that's fine. I just it, it, because it was the central sort of mm-hmm. you know the the reason where this fork really dovetails. I just wanted to at least get to it. Yeah. Um. So. I guess to summarize what we've got so far is how how long do we think this sort of British conquest of northern Africa well, take? Do, does that get us to like the fall of 41 or are we stretching into early 42? Oh, no, that's what I think. I think that that's the other reason I think this, you know, they don't nothing changes in a Greek campaign, because I think if they keep going April, May, when. Greece is finally gone. Mm-hmm. Um, that is when you see the you know final finalization of um, North Af- of Italian North Africa. Yeah. So basically, the the Greek campaign is the 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 final nail in the sort of retrenchment that I was talking about of the northern versus the southern Met, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You've got okay. a, draws a line right across the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's natural. Um, this so. Basically, I guess when do, do we think that? So the the Yugoslavia and Greece surrendered in like basically the, by the end of April forty one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we think that the next big thing on the sort of timeline checklist of things Hitler's got on his checklist is uh, Barbarossa, which he famously delayed a month supposedly because of this whole mess he had to get Mussolini out of. Just to get y'all's opinion on it, do y'all think that that ends up being impacted at all by the loss in North Africa? Does he delay it another couple of weeks while he gets his stuff together? Does he pull a classic Hitler and completely ignore it and just go full steam ahead? Yeah. So Barbarossa, you don't think, you don't think changes material, at least in the outset, all materially that much? Okay. Not at all. Yeah. It was kind you of know, a wild card opinion. I just wasn't sure. Just, just looking one of the things I thought about looking at this beforehand is Rommel was was very well regarded, but if you look at the numbers and troops that he had in North Africa compared to, I think I compared it to the Third Battle of Kursk, had something like four times as many Germans involved as oh yeah yeah the, it, as the Africa Corps at the height of it yeah um I, I I'm not gonna pick on you Dylan. Oh no! This, you, you can you, pick you on me all you want. said care. you're not a World War II. Um, Robert, what were the first two Battle of Kursk about? <laughs> <laughs> all about the oil <laughs> um, just, and everything just, else. In, in in that like, just the numbers that are involved in Barbarossa. Oh, they're like wow. Kursk. Yeah, Kursk, yeah. Kursk is like. Well, one of them's like three hundred thousand. Yeah, Soviets yeah. get encircled on one of them. Don't yeah, and like casualties it's, it's, are insane. It's, it's mid six figures. Yeah, it's it's nuts. Oh, third Kharkov, third battle of Kharkov. Kharkov. Yeah, it was. There's only one Kursk. Okay. Anyway, well, technically, technically, there's two now, as of like six months ago, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, regardless, it's 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 crazy the amount of like this is a this is the entire Africa Corps is a bad day on the yeah. Eastern Front. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I guess to kind of keep keep big picture, because since we've changed the North Africa timeline. So the other, I guess, big question that that deals with is so, you know, once Germany invades Barbarossa and you've got the the, the surrender in Greece, that basically then, in, at least in the, the normal timeline, taking out the, the Pacific, that then the, the focuses are Casablanca and Tunisia, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit. Whatever the Churchill and Stalin and, and Roosevelt are doing, trying to figure out a way to get back onto the continent and the Eastern theater. So if the, you know, in our timeline, the North African theater was a good way, it was a good way to weed out a bunch of generals. And it was a good way for, especially the Americans, to kind of cut their teeth in this new sort of form of warfare, especially in foreign operations. What does this earlier, you know, done by the end of 41, let's say, or beginning of, you know, January oh. 42, maybe, um, North Africa campaign do in terms of, especially the American involvement? Because 
December of 41 is kind of an important month for the Americans in World War II. So what does that do to the, uh, you know, the experience of all these generals and these armies in what is eventually going to help or now maybe not help them when they start going into mainland Europe proper? So I think one of two important things. First, the fact that North Africa was still going in 1942 was critical in British negotiations with the Soviet Union. It allowed them to actually, you know, the Soviet Union, we just got done saying the Soviet Union's fighting like the entire German army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this allowed Churchill to say there are British troops facing German troops somewhere. The other part of this is, I think, the way that the war played out after North Africa got settled with the invasion of Sicily, Mm -hmm. trying to work its way up the Italian boot and everything, is an outgrowth of the fact that we had that the that the Western allies had kind of a center of gravity down there and a temple almost. Mm-hmm. Once you get well, the naval, the, some of the naval invasive operations kind yeah. of gave a sort of a, a, a go by, basically. That more, more so that like they had a lot of troops in that area, mm-hmm. and the rather than trying to move them to the Atlantic coast and up to Britain, that's why they try and go through the Central Mediterranean. Hey, t- tennis to tennis to Sicily is a short short boat ride. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah, it's like Miami to Cuba. It's not much. Yeah, right. If you don't have that, if by the way, maybe Tunis is actually neutral. Yeah. Um, nobody's there. You've got British troops, and I just, I you know, and and in my notes about this, I, I don't know where the British are fighting the Germans in early forty one. I I don't know that, or or sorry, early forty two. Yeah. When. The Soviets are screaming for yeah. help, especially in the spring of '42, when the um, Brit- when the Germans launch their you know southern thrust that turns into Stalingrad. I don't know. Well, what- and, and is it a month early? Does Stalingrad, Stalingrad you mean? Or does he delay the entire? Does does Barbarossa happen one month earlier? Because that actually matters. Well, I think Barbarossa happens when it does. Okay, and we're going because yeah, because Greece. Greece and Hugo doesn't change much, which okay. means that Barbarossa but, delay doesn't really change. I think. But okay. I, but but I'm talking 42 a year yeah, later, right, right? After their stop before Moscow, the drive that turns into Stalingrad. So I have an idea for a yeah. potential. Alternative. Yeah. I, and so obviously the, the one is we brought up the Vichy France question of, you know, they have North Africa. Maybe that gives an invasion of Vichy French, France, no, blah, 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 Vichy France by the free French, the British and the Americans maybe sitting right off the coast saying, hey, please give me some place to land a, a joint declaration of war, maybe with the assumption that Vichy in the south of France is going to be the soft underbelly. But. I have an alternate idea, and this is – I have no idea how realistic this is. This is just my basic understanding of some of the things that had already happened in the war that may give Roosevelt – or sorry, Churchill something to present to Stalin. So what about – you have all these all these British troops, and you by now are starting to have all these American troops in 42 that are working their way over. You know, you're starting to get – naval invasion preparations for what in our timeline is going to be the North African invasion, but you also have some movement into, you know, mainland UK for training and staging and whatever. What about an attempt at regaining Norway for tact- for tactical and morale considerations? Because you already have the attempted British rescue of Norway to keep Sweden from exporting iron through Norway's ports to get to Germany because Swedish steel, very important for the German war effort. What do we think of the idea? And this is, here's my, my presentation of this. Churchill presents this Norwegian 
you know, invasion as an idea of, hey, here's our front. It's not in the German mainland. So we don't have to have as much men and material to try and attack a directly German occupied, you know, position. We can go back to Norway. There's a significant resistance movement already. There's a, a Norwegian army in exile, a Navy in exile, and an uh, Air Force in exile. Mm -hmm. And that presents not just a, a, a land invasion to open a second front, but that also restricts U-boat movement for the Battle of the Atlantic that is still going on and forces them to that go was, through the channel. That, that actually is point. good. The, yeah. the, the fact that, I mean, where's Tirpitz? Tirpitz yeah, it's, was, it's still hanging out up there. The, the Tirpitz was the sister ship to Bismarck. It yep. was a battleship. Uh, you have Luftwaffe airplanes. You have submarines. You have mm -hmm. other all, German All the U-boat yards units. are on the – like in Hamburg and all those north German cities on the Baltic. They're, they're there, but those ships are now going up into Norwegian fjords. Yep. And the, the, the other part that I love about this – you know, and, and you hint at it. I just want to explicitly state this. This actually makes the resupply of the Soviet Union feasible. Very easy. Very yeah. much more easy than than it was in our timeline. And, mm -hmm. and and there's another point that I want to bring up just because it it if we get to the aftermath of the war, it's gonna come up more, I think. But one of the concerns for the British especially was especially under Churchill being a Victorian sort of classic imperialist that he was. How do we maintain Britain's imperial position in the world? And I think the invasion of Norway is a way for him to say, hey, Americans, you can take a Norwegian invasion. We've already got all our troops in North Africa, so we can handle things down there, maybe do a soft underbelly, a Sicily, whatever. But I think, one, it's a way of giving Stalin what he wants, a second front that has a lot of strategic economic and positioning value, but also it's a way for him to give the Americans a way to attack, but divert them to avoid them stealing the credit <laughs> from Churchill's perspective for a lot of British achievements so that he can keep Britain as the, the sort of third leg of the stool of this sort of, you know, allied war effort, because that's always going to be in the back of his mind. So, you know, if you have American troops going to mainland UK, which they're already doing, you don't have to sell them on, hey, go down to North Africa. You can just keep going up to Manchester and Liverpool and, you know, all the other cities that you're going to and start working on an invasion out of Scotland to go to Narvik. You know, go send all the people from Minnesota They're They got family over there. They'll be fine. They can go meet up with their relatives. You know, I think the the political side of the equation I, is not to be under under value i'm i'm laughing at what you're saying just in the, from that perspective because one um it, it was famously said that when the united states invaded sicily in july of 43 there were more italians fighting in american uniforms than there were in or italian Italians. uniforms yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 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 as somebody who's grandfather was there and was actually detained because they thought he was a spy yeah no that happened um yeah. I, I i like that idea of giving well uh, now, and, and it's a way to get the Americans. actually work is the yeah. other thing because well, God, yeah. there were some harebrained schemes that they came up with well, but the, the idea other, for the presentation yeah. is you know the other part of it is this i mean i think we're all kind of you know in, in my notes nice. about this I, I, I asked who here knows who Lloyd Friedenhall was. And I literally Googled it. <laughs> yep. I expected I expected most people to. Yeah, I would ha I had to Google yep. him. So. Yep. Yep. Uh, Free Lloyd Friedenhall was the American commander in North Africa that got beat for for most of us, basically, that are familiar familiar with this when in the movie Patton, when he just takes over, Freed Hall is who he took over from, in effect. Yeah. Um, and and what I talked about was the importance of it gets to the importance of North of in our timeline, the North African campaign in weeding out the dead weight, in we, weeding out the people that can't hack it. And the one thing I find interesting thinking about a Norwegian campaign is this. How useful is Patton 
in a Norway? That's exactly what I was going to get to. <laughs> Norway is not good tank country. So, so any yeah. any tank commanders, you know, Patton especially, and there none of them are going to be able to to do this. And also, yeah. you have if you're if you're invading Norway in, you know, the summer of '42 or even in '43. That's a couple of years of tank development that you don't have to take advantage of either. So even if there are tanks that would be effective in Norway, um, you know, t- now I'm envisioning tanks with ski pole treads, which is a great mental image. Um, they're not the same tanks because they haven't had these couple of years of R&D, throwing things at the wall, failures in the field to learn from either. The, the other thing I'm thinking about is this. When... The British, you, you mentioned the British actually did try. The British and French did try and invade Norway in April it's 40. Of 1940. Yeah. Um, the British Navy suffered massive, not massive, but significant casualties by coming in too close to land and getting hit by land-based aircraft. If we're envisioning, and I think we can all agree that by the end of 41, North Africa settled. If we're envisioning um, the landings we're talking about here, trying to take pressure off of the Soviet Union with the launch of the German Spring Offensive, we're probably looking at landings in Norway around June of 1942. June of 42. Yeah. 42 Uh, or 43. It Forty-two. Okay. It becomes torch. Um, here's Norway the funny thing. becomes torch. Yeah. The thing is this: in our timeline, the role of the navy in torch was as taxi drivers. No offense. Mm-hmm. To just get the troops there. I think if the if we go with this plan, the navy is much more involved, and there's a very good reason I described this the way I did. The United States Navy is a little busy at the beginning of June 1942. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. So. Well, the Pacific Theater but, is busy. Right. But exactly. there's, so, so, and so to, and I don't, dis, don't disagree that we'd have some Navy concerns, but do you think that if the British don't have to deal with as much in North Africa because it's closed up, that alleviates some of the supply issues of having to go around Africa? So. You know, not to not to counter your point, but maybe to to yeah. kind of shave it back a little bit. There would, I think, at least be some extra British ships that could help, especially ones that might have more familiarity in those waters. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I'm thinking about is we're mentioning June. If we extend this to August, what kind of landing are we talking about doing in Norway? It would be amphibious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a marine operation. Yeah. So the question would be, do we pull the 1st Marine Division and not take Guadalcanal, but send them to Norway? If you look at U.S. Cold War plans, the Marines were going to be deployed to Norway if there was, an, if there was a war there. That's an amphibious operation. That's what they do. I, I think they still <laughs> use the Army. I okay. think, yeah, I think the I, army because I just for ge- geolocation convenience, yeah. I think and, trying to get Marines all around the world is just not quick okay. enough. Okay. And, and also much. there's, there's SAS and Norwegian special forces that they already have on hand right. that they can do for an initial land. And you know, plus, what they had thought about from the beginning, remember was the Navy was going to run the show in the Pacific mm-hmm. with the exception yeah. of, of the Australian Southern Anzac stuff. Yeah. yeah. But okay. the Navy was okay. going to run that and the army was going to run Europe. So, so do, do we, we, we have a successful Norwegian campaign? Uh, I I don't. So, uh, yes and no. Okay. I think it's I think it's successful short term and maybe medium term in that it disrupts Swedish exportation of iron to Germany, which is a significant thing all on its own that that does some damage, especially when we get to talking about Eastern Front stuff. I think even if we have a Norwegian front, I think there still has to be an actual landing. I think there has to be another invasion somewhere oh, yeah. directly to the continent. Well, so by the way, I, I'm building up to a couple of other things. 
I always am. <laughs> so you think we're able to basically clear Norway of German forces? Yeah, I, I would say at least the parts that matter. I mean, I, I okay. would argue as long as you can solidify sort of the southern, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the Norwegian resistance in World War II, but just from what I know about general, you know, Nordic geography, most of the important cities are in the south. Yes. And all the ports. So if you can get that, you can kind of leave the Norwegians standing on their own two legs in the north because Narvik. that's less. Narvik is up north. And yeah. that's and, why and, it's so and if you take Narvik, mm -hmm. you can then kind of meet, do a pincer movement. And the primary front is going to be making sure that the Germans don't come from the south. So mm -hmm. once you can get a Norwegian, you know, a free Norway government back in Norway, you can kind of use their army, their troops to take care of liberating Norway, because that's I mean, where it's going to do the most good. Just, just you know, being Americans, we're going to want to finish that job. Yeah. So I think we're going I, to... Yeah, but I think the primary thrust is going to be focused south. So we're going... Well, we're going to drive south, take mm -hmm. Oslo... Denmark, if we can get across it, maybe. Well, you don't see, think that's so? the other. I, I, I'm not sure if we can, but here's one of the things I was thinking about. Looking geographically, um, Don did a solo episode on the importance of the P-51 Mustang. Ah. I, yeah, I see it turning. You you know where I am, don't you? I have another idea for where this could also change things, but I, I'll let you uh, keep going first. And it was very important, the strategic bombing offensive, being able to base fighters closer to Germany. Mm-hmm with range, and we couldn't do it. Yep. So Southern now you have a way to negate that. Southern Norway might actually provide, especially Northern Hamburg. And at, Southern at the Norway, very least, it, it's, it's closer is distance for bombers, too. Range. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, that allows you to do damage on the shipping yards, which are... Well, listen, the bombers have the distance. The bombers can do it. I mean... You yeah, know, I guess bombing. I guess what I'm getting at is it it means you don't have the car the the carnage in the bomber cores because they they don't have to go as far one and they can turn around and come back instead of having to do the weird shoot over Germany go down to North Africa trips that they used to have to do and they can have fighters and they can have escorts yep and I don't know if this is going to do all that much in the the grand scheme of things but and I also don't know about you know Arctic Ocean shipping lanes but. Norway's a lot closer of a meeting point between the Soviet Union and the United States for the purposes of shipping things, mm -hmm. at least in the, the summer months. Mm -hmm. So you potentially I don't I don't know that you'd have a ton, at least at first, but you potentially would be looking at at least some, you know, calm expeditionary forces, maybe going around Finland to the north and meeting up on like in Archangelsk meeting the Soviets and trying to give them some relief in the North, maybe at the very least some, you know, it's an easier route to get supplies. So this was one of the things I was initially thinking about was if the British army is freed up, is there pressure from the Soviets to give them a front in Russia? You've got these British troops that aren't doing anything to fight Germans. Well, that, and so that's why I was going with the the idea of the Norway landing being mm -hmm. given to the Americans, because that then leads the British troops to either go against Italy going up the boot or to go up against Vichy in like you know, Provence and, you know, the sort of south of France. I, area. I, I think first the the I think what you could see is a British army going after Sicily mm -hmm. and then climbing up the island chain. The Sardinia and Corsica and then that way? That way, because you can't jump to southern France. Not direct, yeah, from North yeah. Africa. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, you'd have to have some base to get mm -hmm. closer. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to point out and talk about is Dieppe. August of 42, before the Americans land, the British launched the Dieppe landings. That was a raid. It, it, right. They were a raid. And, <laughs> but, and yeah. it, was, it was an attempt to actually land and capture. It was designed as like not we're we're not actually gonna hold anything, but it was designed as an attempt 
to explore what you know like probe the defenses basically mm -hmm. i mean you yeah, were talking yeah. about this earlier dylan like yeah. and, and we all agree there's going to need to be anglo-american troops in western europe how do you get them there so dieppe was an attempt to capture a, a french channel port and see what the defenses are like what kind of problems we run into all of these things um also it was meant to make sure there were british troops fighting in europe before the americans were fighting in europe because they wanted torch but also in all of the planning the united states was opposed to the italian campaign because it was a sideshow yeah. like i said the americans are going to go right at it they might have been okay going after norway as soon as they're as soon as they're done marching into Oslo, they're, they're going to start looking. Yeah, they're going back to Great Britain and they want to cross the channel into France, period. So Dieppe becomes more than just a raid and it's U.S. and Canadian troops. Um, Does Dieppe happen? <laughs> do those do those by the way, do those amphibious resources get moved north to the Narva Atlantic? Or, yeah, that, I definitely think that happens. Does is there a. <clears throat> Because I like the idea of a Dieppe, one, as an exploration mission, but two, also as a, a kind of a, hey, surprise, we're here. It turns out, no, we're not. So do we have, in this timeline, since we've got a front in Norway and at least some naval contest of the, the North Sea, you've got a unified North Africa. You know, especially if the British get maybe a couple of islands, you know, Sicily and Sardinia, maybe not Corsica yet, but something that gets them, they're kind of trending that way. Do you have a Dieppe style sort of, you know, cross between an exploration attempt and like a false flag? We're going to try it Vichy well, in the south while the real meat is coming from the north. What I'm building towards is this. I don't think there is a Dieppe landing in August. You think they're just going to go hard and go straight at it when they do? Like full think, D day? I think the, well, see, here's the important thing. I think the United States... I think the amphibious resources, because don't forget, Torch was a joint yeah. Anglo-American operation. I think the Anglo-American operation becomes Norway. Not not to put too fine a point on it, but what freaking front is better to send Canadians to than Norway? Norway. <laughs> <laughs> um, we love you up there, brothers. Um, you get well. You get there. You, you get that, and you also get you know all the troops, Tenth Mountain Division type troops. Mm -hmm. All of that group heads that direction, one hundred percent. But 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 my my what I'm getting at is this, right? Like the British probably are able to play in the Mediterranean, maybe take Sicily. The United States is you know the Anglo American whatever operation is going to take over Norway, but then the United I mean you're not going to have American troops transferred all the way around Europe to go into Italy. Um, so, like, if the up doesn't happen and those resources are used in Norway, we don't learn a lot of the important lessons that we did at Dieppe. And I think it's an interesting question. Like, I mean, for example, one of the one of the first one of the very important lessons of Dieppe was you can't take a port. When we came back, we brought a port with us. Yeah, mm -hmm. The mulberries. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we don't know that. We we haven't learned that lesson. So I think if the United States if if you know Norway is the forty two in forty three the United States is pushing for a cross-channel invasion in 43. And I think, you know, you you don't have Montgomery because, no, you know, he doesn't rise to prominence. You don't have Patton to distract the Germans. You don't have Eisenhower running it. Oh, by the way, you don't have Rommel on the other side. Mm -hmm. Overseeing the that. fortifications and all that, yeah. Right. So I think we've got ourselves a part two here, a very nice wrap up of 
So we're what in. It's there. Right. Our, in, our alternate D Day and. We're, we're, we're in end January 43, is where um, we are. Mid 43. You know, let's call it February 43. Only okay. Because I want, you know, Tehran has hap- Tehran happens. February of 43, that is wow. when, that is another of these examples of Stalin yelling and screaming, hey, listen, I just got Stalingrad back. That just happened. But I need a second front. And the United States and Great Britain are telling him, you know, in our timeline, we're telling him, well, we'll have this and that. We will land this spring in Western Europe. And that is what Stalin wanted. That's what the Americans wanted. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that straight line, I think, is part two of this. Okay. I think that might work. <laughs> All <So> right. That <laughs> was, that was, I, I like that because that, that gives us a nice dramatic start and a nice dramatic end. So good. Okay. We can there you go. that. So, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're so there. I guess so now we so now we built another fork that's going to have a long term long term co- consequences because now we don't have patent. You're welcome, and now I'm not the only <laughs> one who's done this. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess any any just while we still have the stage kind of set, any last thoughts about any quick notes about things? I do want to say that the Higgins boat is is a, a timing factor here as well, depending on how early we get because it's only. That they only start testing in like May of 41. So yeah. a stockpiling yeah. of Higgins boats is also a concern that we've got to figure out here. So I think we're still OK with that timeline, but it may look very different. I mean, again, we had, you know, we the, the boats we used at Husky are the ones we would use. July yeah. of 43 was Husky in Sicily. So we're going to use them somewhere else. We're going to figure out where we're going to do that. Um the other thing that went through my mind was this. We, we kind of glazed over it. We'll come back to this, I think. If the way back, okay, if you can remember somehow where this started, um, British troops aren't set to defend Greece and Crete. And one of the key points about the Cretan invasion, the invasion of Crete, was this. It was done solely as an airborne operation. And they suffered massive casualties to these troops that had been pulled out of North Africa. And basically, this was the last time that German airborne troops were used in the airborne capacity. Afterwards, they were used as regular foot infantry. And the Germans, by the way, had been very successful in using them in their invasion of the low countries and, 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 and at other points. So that's something else we haven't addressed is, are they deployed somewhere in some of this? Yeah. And that, and that could get us to an important part in whatever we figure our D-Day out to be is what, you know, does, what is the airborne and air war kind of, you know, we, we touched on it with Norway, but like, what is the air war look in, mm-hmm. in some of this, especially as we get landing. So or, that could or, be an interesting part. As another thought, are they all just sent into Stalingrad? <laughs> With the ghost of Erwin Rommel. Yeah, all, all of these things and more in the second part of this episode. <laughs> to, to, to paraphrase Dragon Ball Z from my childhood, tune in next week. So, yeah, did, um, Robert, Dylan, you guys have any other thoughts? No, I, 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 other than the, the only thing I think I want to try to settle super quick because it will matter. Mm. Does Eisenhower still run the Norway invasion? I think he does. I think Eisenhower. Yeah. I think I can still there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because so. I think I think by that point he's in Britain as the, the overall American commander. I think okay. it's just a question of where he is, not that he yeah. is there. <laughs> some of his some of his generals underneath him, you know, Patton Friedenhall and all that crew. <laughs> I think that's where you start seeing some different staffing that yeah. becomes other, maybe yeah. material. The other part of this is Eisenhower has only been in command of American forces. Yeah, he right. has never commanded British forces, and the British are not familiar with him. I, yeah, I would actually say if we look at this Norway situation, you know, one, I think Ike, 
this this is Ike's first chance at commanding a sort of multinational coalition. And it's a very different makeup because, to be perfectly honest, it's probably going to be much more Norwegian than it is. Well, it, it's British. American, Canadian and, and Can, yeah, US. Canadian, Norwegian and, and American. Because of the, yeah. Yeah. That's so, because the Diep group basically gets shifted to the Norway mm-hmm. group. So yeah. it goes that direction. One hundred percent. And by the way, I think, you know, it, I, I forget who said that Americans and British are two people separated by the same language. The funny thing about Canadians are is that they're the they're, they're Commonwealth people that sound like Americans. So there's kind of a more natural partnership there. Yeah. 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 OK, well, come back for part two. Um, just want to encourage everybody that if they should come uh, upon a fork in the road, what should they do? They need take to it. take it. All right. See you guys next time. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time. 